All right, we see that PC3 ARP cache is blank. Okay. Okay, we'll send a ping from PC3, PC2. All right. Okay, we see that the uh, ping was generated, but also ARP. Why is ARP generated? Why is ARP broadcast generated? Because PC3 does not know PC2's MAC address. Now, ARP is a broadcast, meaning the switch is going to, even if the, even if the switch know where that MAC address resides, it's still going to send it out to all ports because ARP by nature is, is a broadcast. Okay? All right, I see we have a question. Well, you, you may want to ask, well, why is ARP by nature a broadcast? So let's take a look at the packet. Outbound, look at the destination address. All Fs is broadcast. That means uh, whatever device, whatever connectivity device, i.e. switch, receives it, it means the switch go ahead and send it out every port. It's broadcast. Okay, okay let's uh, do a capture forward. ARP is going to the switch, and it's broadcast. Only the device that's listed within that ARP frame should on. It's going to be PC2. Now, again, why is PC3 sending ARP? Because it needs to get the MAC address, PC2. Okay. All right, let's uh, go ahead and inspect the ARP table. Let me see the uh, association there. Okay. So what happens if Well, that's a very good question. What happens if we connect PC2 to a different port? Same IP address. Same IP address. All right. Uh, PC3 will not have to send another ARP broadcast because it still knows the MAC address. However, the switch may have a problem. Because let's take a look at the switch table. All right, PC, this is uh, PC2's uh, MAC address, and it is port 10. Port 10. So, so right now, the switch knows that that particular MAC address is associated with 14. Now, this is definitely un unscripted. So let's, let's see what happens within packet tracing. All right. Okay. Hmm, port 18. <laughs> okay. Let's reset the simulation. Okay, we have ICMP generated. Okay, notice we didn't see ARP. There's no ARP uh, protocol there. Because like I said earlier, PC3 is still aware of PC2's MAC address. Now I'm curious to see how the switch handles this, the switch and packet trace of that is. Whoa. It broadcasts it because the switch is uh, it, 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 it's lost its association. It lost the port to MAC address association. Okay.
At this point, let's uh, take a look at the uh, MAC table. Notice we don't see PT2's MAC address. It's lost association. It needs to learn it again. So it has to switch broadcast the uh, ping, but only the device that should answer will do so. And that will give the uh, switch a chance to learn the uh, learn that MAC address and its association with a certain port. Because it didn't go to green? Is that probably why I didn't get it far back from it? Now it's not from green anymore. Excuse me? Okay. All right. Let's check out the switch. Has it learned it? There it is, yep. Okay. So presently it knows about two MAC addresses, two different ports. All right. What happened? It clears all the cache. By default, Cisco switches will clear the MAC address table cache after 300 seconds. What's that? Yeah, that's the aging. So what's 300 seconds in terms of minutes? Yeah, five minutes. Okay. okay. Now, let me ask you this question. When does a switch learn MAC address? Okay. Let me refine my question. What part of the frame will the switch notice in terms of learning a MAC address? You know, the frames have source address and destination address. It only looks at the source. Okay, anytime a frame goes through the switch, the switch will record the source MAC address. And if it doesn't have a mapping for it, then I'll go ahead and make a mapping. It, uh, it, what I mean by mapping, it uh, will associate that MAC address with a port. Is this the source, the first one, and then you reply back. Okay. Um, PC3 sent a ping, right? It went to the switch. At that moment, the switch learned PC3's MAC address because it, it's looking at the source field, okay? Um, PC2 replied, right? At that point, the switch learned PC2's MAC address because it looked at the source field. It only looks at the source field, okay? It looks at the source field when it's learning and, and making a map. However, it looks at the destination when it needs to forward, okay? So the question is, why don't administrators statically assign MAC addresses to switches so the switches will not uh, automatically refresh the table every five minutes? Well, the minimum, some of well, many administrators do, and what they'll do is they'll statically assign a MAC address to a particular port. All right. And what that provides is some means of security. Let's say that my PC should only be connected to port F0 slash 2, my PC only. So the administrator will know the MAC address that's associated with my PC, and he'll program that into the switch. Okay, let's say that the janitor comes in after hours, right? This connects my PC from the port and attaches his laptop. Well, that's going to be a new MAC address. And so what the, what the uh, administrator probably also configured was something known as uh, port security, meaning if a new MAC address is learned on that particular port, automatically shut down, okay? All right, okay, we, we danced around a little bit with the packet tracer, but what we did was encompass some of the other concepts that you will encounter within Chapter 9. So I'll move forward with the online module. Um, latency, read that at your leisure. 
to move forward. Um, move forward. Okay, let's look at slot time and bit time. Okay, if we are working with a 10 megabits per second Ethernet network, each bit is traveling at 100 nanoseconds, okay? However, the smallest Ethernet frame on a 10 megabit per second network is 512 bits or 64 bytes, okay? Why do you think there is a limit in terms of the minimum um, byte size? Okay. So, so the writers of the specification or the protocol specify that the minimum frame for 10 megabit per second network is 64 bytes or 512 bits. Okay. Well, how long is, um, well, what's the maximum size of an Ethernet segment? 100 meters, right? Okay. The bit time, or the, the minimum byte size, has much to do with collision. Look at it this way. Imagine that you have a pipe that's about the length of this classroom. And we're talking about a pipe that's maybe an inch in diameter, right? And uh, we're going to send two mosquitoes, you know, <laughs> Oh, in, into a head-on collision type pattern, right? What's the chances of detecting that collision? We're talking about two mosquitoes. Slim to none, right? So and now let's imagine that there are, let's say, 20 devices connected to this pipe. We could imagine that all 20 devices are assuming that the media is clear when they do their carrier sense because they, they don't hear anything being transferred. They didn't detect that collision, right? Okay. Now let's uh, change the scenario a bit. Let's imagine that we're sending 512 mos mosquitoes from one direction to the center of the pipe, and at the other end of the pipe, we're sending 512 mosquitoes. So they're going to, again, we're creating a head-on collision type situation. What's the chances of those 20 devices detecting the collision? very high, okay? So basically, they put a, a minimum size in terms of bytes to give all the devices within uh, that are attached to that 100-meter span enough chance to detect a collision, okay? Right. Why don't they just use a switch? Yeah, but we're, we're trying to get there. We're, we're talking about the days of hub when, when collisions were... Um, prevalent. Okay. But note that 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, both require sending at least 